And welcome to another bonus topic of Math for Game Dev. For those of you tuning in for the first time, this is the series in which we cover math topics that are invaluable for game dev through the exploration of specific examples. However, unlike the core series, this is a bonus video, meaning it's not state mandated viewing material. But I think today's topic is as straightforward as how myriad its applications are. So I hope you'll watch it regardless. And our topic is bitwise operations and bit masking. Also, if you're already a master bitwise operator, I created a toy program that aids in C and C++ development. Skip ahead to the chapter marked coil for info on that if you don't want to watch the entire video. So here are a couple game dev scenarios where bitwise operations and bit masking are useful. First example, let's say we're making a game that uses a tile set for terrain, like Factorio here, and we need a way to tastefully blend between different sets of tiles. In particular, I'm thinking of the shoreline between land and water. You could of course place each tile individually, but that would not be an efficient use of your time. Or if you're leaning on procedural content generation for your levels, it might just not be possible. The other application is say we're writing either a class with a bunch of bools or a function that has a lot of bools as arguments. After a certain point, all those bools just become a pain to read, especially with functions since their calls can become longer than the screen is wide. Not to mention the waste of memory since a bool is 8 bits when we can make do with one if we really had to. This is where bitwise operations and bit masking come in handy. So before we proceed, let's lay down some basic definitions. What are bits? Bits are the ones and zeros of binary data, and there are 8 bits in a byte, which is the smallest addressable unit of memory. Meaning if we ever wanted to modify just one bit, we'd have to perform that modification across the entire byte that contains it at least. Binary numbers, just like decimal numbers, start with the smallest place to the right and then increase. But instead of increasing by powers of 10, binary numbers, like the name implies, increase by powers of 2. So the rightmost bit is the 1s, the first bit from the right is the 2s, second bit from the right is 4s, and so on and so forth. To write out a binary number in most languages, we just prepend it with 0b. So to write out unsigned integer 9 in binary, we'd simply write 0b 1001, since 9 is equal to 8 plus 1, which is equal to 2 cubed plus 2 to the 0. So, how do we modify bits? Well, with bitwise operations. As the name implies, these are the operations that apply to actual ones and zeros of bytes. With real numbers, we have operations like addition and subtraction, but with bits, we have operations that are even lower level. Not, and, or, exclusive or, and bit shifts. If you're familiar with Boolean logic, you can probably guess what they are. Not flips bits, meaning zeros become ones and ones become zeros. And compares two bits. If they're both one, then the resultant bit is also one, otherwise it's zero. Or compares two bits. And if they're both zero, the resultant bit is also zero, otherwise it's one. Exclusive or compares two bits, and if only one of them is one, the resulting bit is one, otherwise it's zero. Exclusive or can also be written as a composite of all the previous operations. Finally, bit shifts just shift all the bits, either left or right, by a given number. Bitwise order of operations aren't always straightforward, so if you're ever in doubt, just slam out parens like a lisper. Now I hear you protesting. I said earlier that if we wanted to modify a single bit, we'd have to modify all the bits of the byte, or bytes, that contain it. And that's true, but we can easily combine bitwise operations so that way only single bits are affected. So if I wanted to flip the fifth bit of a given byte, I could just shift 0b1 to the right by 5 to get 0b10,000, then just exclusive or that with the byte in question. This technique of targeting individual bits is called bit masking, since it masks the bitwise operation to only affect the bits of interest. And we can use bit masking to blend tile sets. I've mocked up a little toy example in C using Raylib and a tile set I got from OpenGameArt. See the description to the link for both. And please understand this is the first time I've ever used Raylib, so if there are better ways to do things I simply do not know. It really has been less than an hour with it. The main idea behind blending tile sets via bit masking is to compare 
cardinal and optionally ordinal neighbors of all the tiles. If the tiles match, the corresponding bit is set to 1, otherwise it's 0. If you just compare cardinal neighbors, i.e. north, south, east, and west, you only need 4 bits. But for cardinal and ordinal neighbors, you'll need 8 bits. If we look at my tile set, it's obvious that I simply do not have enough tiles to cover all the possible combinations. So I had to impose some rules, like all grass tiles need to have at least one neighbor horizontally and at least one neighbor vertically, and also add more control flow to handle the incomplete coverage. I also padded the terrain with water because I simply did not want to handle the edges of the terrain. Here's my blend function. It's pretty hefty, so let's focus on the bit masking part in particular. As we can see, first I compare the tile to its neighbor to the east. If they match, I set the first bit to 1. Then I compare the tile to its neighbor to the north, and if they match, I set the second bit to 1. And I just work my way around the compass twice in such a manner to compare the tile to its cardinal neighbors first, and then its ordinal neighbors second. After that, I just use those 8 bits and information about the tile and its neighbors to set the appropriate sprite in for the given tile. As we can see, I'm using 32 bits for my mask since I'm also caching the terrain types of all the neighbors in the bit mask as well. But since ultimately I am just comparing cardinal and ordinal neighbors, I could have done this with just 8 bits instead. I've uploaded this code to a GitHub gist so you can peruse it if you're interested. Admittedly, I switch between hex and binary willy-nilly. This is a bonus topic after all, so I expect you to rise to the occasion. But again, the main takeaway is that you turn the comparison of a tile and all of its neighbors into a bit mask instead of a bunch of bulls. This takes up less memory and brings all the relevant information closer together. Bit masking also allows us to either reduce or eliminate control flow, which can help your code run faster. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at an actual example from my own code base. I've extracted two functions from my navigational octree code that do the exact same thing. Both give the child of an octant at a specific position, but one uses a switch, the fastest control flow, whereas the other just uses bitwise operations. If we compare the assembly for both functions, even without knowing assembly, we can see that the bitwise function is shorter and has less jumps, meaning it's just plain old faster. Also, ergonomically speaking, when functions have a lot of Boolean arguments, one, it takes up a lot of horizontal screen space, two, it takes more time Time for me to write everything out, and three, my monkey brain can only hold so much information. So that's another W for bit masks in my book. And that's it for bitwise operations and bit masking. Short and sweet. But before the outro, I've been dabbling in making a standalone GD script LSP for Godot. And while it's not done, I do have something that you can download. I'm using TreeSitter to parse GD script since it's got gross white space formatting. And to familiarize myself with the ABI, I created a little program program that I'm calling COIL that expands C and C++ function declarations into barebone definitions. Real talk, I hate writing definitions for class methods, and COIL handles that for me. I am currently the sole user and tester, so there are probably some edge cases and macros it does not handle properly, so I'd like you to download it, give it a try, and give me some feedback. I wrote an Emacs minor mode and a NeoVim plugin that handle the actual use of COIL from inEditor. The Emacs wrapper is pretty good. A little simple, but it works how I want. However, the NeoVim wrapper needs some work still. You can get Coil, the Emacs Minor Mode, and the NeoVim plugin from my GitHub account. Again, it's only me who's been using it, so I've only built it for platforms I'm actually using. So if I don't have you covered, you're gonna have to build it from source yourself. It's a little hefty at over four megabytes because of TreeSitter, but again, I chose to use TreeSitter since I wanted to familiarize myself with it. See the description for the appropriate links. And that's it for this video. Video. I hope you find bitwise operations and coil both useful. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a good day. If you enjoy the video, please give it a like. And if you want to follow along with the 
next video, please subscribe. I'll probably do a video on shaders. New videos every last Friday of the month, unless I say otherwise, but November is looking good. Also read all your comments. Great way to suggest video topics, by the way. I got some people asking me to do a videos on shaders following my last devlog, and that's why it's on the docket for November. The channel has a Discord server where you can hang out, talk about game dev, and chat about math. Last October, some individual that totally is not me streamed a scary movie for Halloween, and I suspect this individual is going to do the same thing again. So if you want to know about this rogue actor's Halloween movie stream, drop on by. I also share pictures of things I bake on them. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. If my voice sounded off this entire video, my allergies are just driving me crazy. Um, but let's get to the baking. All right, what do we got? We got a galette and as you can see, yeah, it's a double. It's a, this is a this one's a two. Oh, well, most of them are two. Well, this one, just like most of them, is a two. That's right, two galettes. As you can see, apple galette. Just mm, I love it. I love apple galettes, and we're in apple galette season. Oh, probably. You know, I've been saying I've been meaning to bake, but I just have not been. God, I'm having too much fun with C. <laughs> Sorry, I just see. Oh my God, C is so much fun. God, and I don't even, here's the thing, all right, total, total digression. You know, in college, uh, my first program course, it was like C++, C, and C++. We learned C for like three weeks, and then it's like, okay, let's learn C++. Now that I'm actually coming back to C, oh, it's, it's so nice. It's such a breath of fresh air. I love it. So that's why, that's why all the code today has been, <laughs> written in C because I'm really loving it and I think uh, I got some plans I got some C plans going looking forward uh, but let's get to the baking all right mm. apple galettes love them love them uh, yeah galettes you know it's I think galettes are just the best some of the best uh, how do I get to the next video ever excuse me how do I get to the uh, next next image I don't know how to get to the next image hold up one second but yeah next image and as we can see this one is pretty close and tight mm. galette's lovely lovely flaky crust easy honestly it's super easy to make I think galette's just mm, as I've said this time and time every time I make galette's I'm like galette's are the best because let's be honest they are super easy to make and delicious you love if you like pie crust you'll like galettes it's pie crusts with with you know proportionally speaking more crusts than filling than pie so it's great now let's take a look at the last picture let's just see how zoomed i can zoomed in i can get it. yeah for that full flaky crusty goodness again uh i think the nice thing about uh, galettes is they're they are a bit more rustic than uh, pies so they're a little bit easier i mean so they're you know the presentation it's just mm, it's charming you know that's my thoughts they're charming they're charming all right they're just less work more charm and yeah as you can see i just slammed the apples in there I, i'm getting real generous with the apples every time i make apple galettes because it's tasty you know it's delicious that's my thoughts on it. And also apples, I think I'm looking at this, it looks like I used a bunch of Honeycrisp apples because I'll be honest, Honeycrisp apples, best apples. They're just hands down my favorite apples. Even just cooking, uh, baking, eating, they're just all around the best. They taste delicious. They got good, nice texture. I will admit, Granny Smith apples baking, they are tart, whereas Honeycrisps are not tart. So if you need, if you need that tartness, gotta hit the granny smiths they gotta be in there but otherwise you know if you just want sweet apples honey crisp that's my advice honey crisp apples also good for eating as well you know sometimes i don't always want to take a bite like they in the out of a granny smith because again I'm not, I'm not always in a i'm a sour guy but i'm not always in a sour mood you know what i'm saying whereas honey crisp mm, always sweet always good so that's it for this episode. And while I did not use, um, let me just cycle on. I did not use yeast in this recipe, but you know, I'm, I'm a fraud. I'm gonna use the classic sign off anyways. Uh, the yeast in the air is free. So go out there and bake. 
It's delicious, it's nutritious, it's good for you, and it makes a great gift. Not the yeast, the baked goods. So, And it's a great way to show people that you appreciate them. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.